Welcome to The Helping Conversation, an exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of facilitating trusting, safe, inclusive, and effective helping conversations with others. The Helping Conversation is at the core of the sacred partnership between two people when one is there to help the other. Recorded at Rock Vox Recording and Production Studios, Rochester, New York. Find your voice and broadcast it to the world at Rock Vox. Rockvox.com. And now your host of The Helping Conversation, Keith Greer. And welcome to this episode of The Helping Conversation. Thanks for joining us and sitting in with us today as we continue our exploration of a variety of different kinds of folks who in their professional world facilitate what we would call a helping conversation. And today we have a, a very special guest uh, joining us uh, in the room to talk about uh, his work as a physician and a very specific part of his work as a physician uh, in the world of uh, mindfulness practice. So please join me in uh, welcoming to The Helping Conversation, Dr. Mick Krasner. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Keith. Thanks for inviting me. So Dr. Mick Krasner is a professor of clinical medicine and professor of clinical family medicine at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. He practices primary care internal medicine here in the Rochester area. Dr. Krasner has been teaching mindfulness-based programs to patients, medical students, and health professionals for more than 20 years, involving over 3,500 participants, including more than 1,500 health professionals. He is engaged in a variety of research projects, including the investigation of the effects of mindfulness practice on the immune system in the elderly, on chronic psoriasis, with caregivers of Alzheimer's patients, and on medical student stress and well-being. He was the project director of Mindful Communication, bringing intention, attention, and reflection to clinical practice, sponsored by the New York chapter of the American College of Physicians, funded by the Physicians Foundation for Health Systems Excellence, and reported in JAMA in September 2009. He is interested in the connection between health professional well-being and the effectiveness of the healing relationship. Dr. Krasner graduated from the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine in 1987 and completed his residency in both internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, where he is currently a full-time faculty member engaged in direct patient care, medical student and residency evaluation, postgraduate medical education and research in the University Center for Mind-Body Research. He has shared his work in peer-reviewed publications, scientific assemblies, workshops, visiting professorships and intensives throughout the world, focusing primarily on the roots of the Hippocratic medicine through the cultivation of attention, awareness, and reflection of the health professional healing relationship. He describes his personal mission as centered on compassion in medicine for the self and others, envisioning a personalized health professional patient relationship where healing is truly bi-directional, care goals are mutually derived, and the uniqueness of the clinical encounter reflects this central act of mutual high regard. Again, join me in welcoming Dr. Mick Krasner. All right, so based on that, Mick, we could be here for about three days. Yeah. There's just a variety of places that I would love to go in. So, um, so let's. I, I should say something. It's, it's interesting to kind of listen to your it own always is, bio, right? and um, I just hope I don't lose all credibility right up front as I've moved from San Diego, California, many many years ago to Rochester, New York. <laughs> as um, a childhood friend of mine, his father said to me, "Oh, Rochester's a really nice place. I've been there. I've done some work there." If you happen to be there on the day they have summer. <laughs> but it's turned out to be a wonderful place to live. It, uh, you know, I was just in this conversation with someone a couple of days ago. And because, uh, you know, as you knew, I, uh, I grew up down by New York City and came up here and have been up here. Uh, Carol and I have been married for 35 years. And I, early in our relationship, we talked about potentially going back down to the New York metropolitan area. And I always say it's the best thing we never did. Mm -hmm. um, this has been a wonderful place to be and to raise our family and have our friends and our community. And, yeah, I yeah, concur completely. Yeah, 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 great place. 
So I always uh, always like to start this conversation by getting a sense of you're here 20 years plus into this career. Um, how did you get here? And maybe even more specifically, because this is where we're really going to focus today, how did you come out of what I'm assuming was probably a pretty traditional medical training and find yourself in this world of mindfulness practices? Yeah, thank you for that question, Keith. It, it is interesting. I think um, as I started off in medical practice after my training, I came to Rochester to finish my residency, to do my residency. And uh, as I began to practice medicine, I began to feel uh, the stress of the career and not that residency and medical school weren't stressful, but I expected that. But then when I moved into the practice of medicine, I realized I have to find something right. to uh, help sustain myself, to help me flourish. Um, and it was really a combination of things, kind of like a perfect storm that led me to mindfulness. I had dabbled a little bit in contemplative practices over the years, but not real seriously. And about the time that I was... Uh, about four or five years into medical practice, um, my father became ill. Mm. And right about that very same time, I had seen a public television special called Healing and the Mind. And I did have a very traditional medical education. Despite being in Southern California, uh, UC San Diego was quite traditional and very, very scientifically based. Um, and I didn't really get a lot of the biopsychosocial uh, influences that I did get here in Rochester, which were tremendous. So I watched this television show, a uh, six-part series, Healing in the Mind, and one of the um, one of the segments featured a program on mindfulness-based stress reduction. It had started out at the University of Massachusetts, and it featured the person who developed the program named John Kabat-Zinn. And my father, who had become ill with a terminal illness, it turned out, um, uh, I thought about the program, and I thought, well, boy, that would be interesting. He, maybe he should watch this. And it turns out there was a book that was a companion mm. to the program, and it was called Full Catastrophe Living. This was Ooh. the original book by John Kabat-Zinn, <laughs> and it was about how the, the life itself in some ways is full of all sorts of catastrophes. You can't right. really get through life without a catastrophe. And um, I read the book and sent it to my father for him to read. And then he wound up living with a condition that has an average life expectancy of about six months. He lived for about two and a half years very well. He took up the practice of meditation very seriously, would travel out of town. Uh, he lived in the Los Angeles area yeah. and would go on retreat and was a very serious practitioner. And I still hadn't really uh, caught on until I realized this is this is really helping him live right. better, even though it was living through the end of his life. And at that point, I really became more serious. This was uh, 1996, right? And I decided I should really start. Uh, this could be helpful for me as I saw the stresses in right. medicine. Right. At that point, as you were exploring mindfulness practices, was it more from the perspective of? boy, I really need to grab onto some kind of practice given the stresses and strains of this profession I, I chose or also envisioning bringing this to the patients that you work with. Yeah, I had no idea at the time that I would be making a part of my work career uh, in that way as a teacher or a facilitator of programs. I It was really for myself. It was really sort of like a life, life, uh, life vest to help me attain some sort of buoyancy in this career that had so many stresses. Also, right. at the same time, as you know, I was uh, early into my family. I had a few children and a third one on the way by the late 1990s. And so it became clear that, you know, not only is there the work life, there's the home life, and people talk about balance. And, it, <laughs> and I've never really um, bought into the balance. You can't really balance. Yeah, good luck. It's more like, uh, how do you integrate them? Right. And um, this also became as I got into the mindfulness practice, it became a way of being that I felt benefited not just me and my well-being, but clearly benefited um, the people around me. Right, yeah. right. 
and then you know we can we can talk a little bit yeah. more about how I then moved it into sort of becoming a teacher yeah. of this. Yeah. And, I like what you said about about the, the whole because I also have always struggled with this concept of work life balance. Like somehow these two parts of our lives are mutually exclusive. Yes. Right. Instead of to use your word integrated, and let's just figure out how we're doing life. Right, 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 exactly. As if, as if work is not life. I mean, to, to <laughs> say, okay, I'm just going to leave life for a while and go spend right. eight hours outside of life at work until I can get back at life. Yeah. You know, and, you know, a, a career like yourself as a, a behavioral health professional, psychologist, or as a medical professional, um, you know, we sacrifice a lot of our time and effort and energy uh, engaged in the salt mines of learning just to get to the point where we can practice. Right. It should be something that I think is integrated into people's yes. lives because otherwise um, if we see it as just a means of supporting a life outside of the work, right. it's not really sustainable. Right. And I think as you've said, cause I know it's true in, you know, in the professional path I've walked, if I don't figure out how to do that integration, if I don't figure out how to take care of myself, then I'm not going to last really long. And I'm, you know, I know in my world and in your world, we have watched people who are, wonderfully talented professionals not stay in the profession yes and that's a shame because it's a huge investment from not just your personal investment but the society's investment right. in you uh what goes into a training of a health professional is not just what's coming out of my pocket but it's actually the whole community that's supporting one right. to do that right right yeah the, the other thing i want to say about this balance issue i think one thing that really attracted me to mindfulness, it was about um, entering into a domain of being rather than doing. Uh, and when I, when one looks at balance uh, in life, you can think think about, imagine yourself having a, uh, a weight or a bar on your shoulders. And when you're in balance, maybe there's too much on one side. And so a typical response is to, why don't we add a little more weight on this side to balance it out? And then that gets off center. You add a little more weight on the other side, and pretty soon you're being crushed by yeah. the amount of weight. It's just adding more and more. And I didn't feel like I just need mm. to do more. I need to be more. I need to just, uh, you know, become superhuman. Right. Uh, it was more an unburdening, uh, which was what I learned in, in mindfulness, that it was undoing. It was more seeing how um, I can cultivate this domain of being right. and how the being informed my doing. Right, how, yeah. right. I, I'm sitting here thinking because, boy, I know I'm guilty of, of that as, you know, for those of us who have put a lot of time and energy into our professional development, our professional growth, how easy it could be in a moment to, to use your metaphor of, of, you know, being out of balance with that barbell to just say, okay, I have to add something yes. to the other side versus what do I let go of? Right, right, Yeah, right. And that's a constant struggle. I don't think you're alone in that. I'm, <laughs> I certainly still struggle with, you know, and, and our appetites are huge, yes. right? We see we want things. There's consumerism appetites. There's appetites that have to do with our health and well-being. If I just would exercise more and spend more time, you know, attending to how I prepare my meals and cook, all of this takes time yeah. and attention and awareness um, but if we don't, if we're not really aware of what's happening, we can find the time aspect just being sucked up, and we have very right. little for anything. Right, right. Especially for ourselves. Yeah, for ourselves. Yeah. So I'm always curious with folks uh, who are in uh, in the helping world. If we go back childhood, as you look back on that time, the evidence that was there, maybe not that you were going to be a physician, but that you were going to be in a helping profession. Mm. Any evidence that we would have seen back from uh, younger days? Yeah, it's really an interesting thing. I can share a little story growing up. I, I did know at an early age, think at an early age, and then I stepped away from it and then I came back to it, that I did want to go into uh, health professions. I remember uh, as a young child, five or six years of age, um, being at the pediatrician and being examined and just having this sense of, not awe, but it was just a more sense of, um, oh, like there was a ritual that was involved that was a very deep and grounded ritual of being examined and spoken to and uh, that occurred in the office. I didn't quite have words for it because I didn't have the cognitive understanding of it, but it was something that was very attractive to me. Um, and then 
I remember once uh, I had a small job, some jobs around the house. I earned maybe 10 or $12 at the time. And I, um, I had the op- opportunity to spend that money. So my mother said, you know, what, what would you like to buy it on? And I really like Dr. Seuss. So I thought <laughs> maybe I'll buy a lot of Dr. Seuss's books. And we went to the bookstore and I saw this book called The Human Body. And, uh, and I picked about three Dr. Seuss books out and uh, the human body. And I was like this. And my mother said, you, you'll have to choose which one would you How old like. About how old were you? Probably like eight. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I chose the human body. And I was just fascinated by the pictures and the workings of it. And so there was this also attraction to the, the mechanics and the images that I saw on there. Uh, and that was connected with somehow what my pediatrician and his relationship with yeah, me. Yeah. So that's what I chose. And uh, so I, there was something inside of me that knew I wanted to do something along those lines. And, and our family, uh, we had a large family of six. I was fifth of six. And my brother, just older than me, had a chronic illness, uh, mm. of which he eventually died from. Um, and there was always a sense of um, really no pressure from my parents, but more a sense of I don't know. I just knew that I wanted to be of service in some way to humans, uh, in my siblings, and ha- our service in other ways to human beings at different levels. But I, I wanted a more direct connection. Right, right, right. That's awesome. Yeah, I just, I just don't think it's a coincidence. Most of us have chosen yeah. the field we have chosen, right? Right. And especially around helping. So let's jump into to to all of this work you do with mindfulness, and let's start with with. Um, how you have brought this to your conversations with colleagues. Um, what are you hearing in the year 2020? Never mind even even COVID. So let's just say before COVID, because I can't imagine what it's like right now, um, around how they are coping as they come out of med school with the demands of being a physician. I think it's very, very challenging. Uh, there's a construct uh, called burnout, and it's a... Uh, technical construct that with the measurement one can take and burnout in the medical professions and especially among physicians is exceedingly high. It consists of three major components. One has to do with just feeling emotionally exhausted. Another has to do with um, what they call depersonalization. So it's really treating things and seeing things as objects just getting in your way rather than the human relationship. And then the third has to do with a low sense of personal accomplishment. And uh, upwards of 50 to 60 percent of physicians uh, are burnt out, and depending on specialties. The primary care specialties seem to be particularly at risk um, because they're just on the ground, sort of on the ground floor, uh, doing the uh, doing the hard work. Uh, not that other physicians right, aren't. Right. Um, and it has been challenging this recognition that this that burnout is exists, that it's important. Why is it important? Well, it turns out there's a clear connection between well-being of physicians and other health professionals and quality of care. Mm. This is actually beyond dispute now that it was a theory at one time and empirical evidence has supported that connection between our well-being and the type of work that we do and how outcomes, the patient outcomes. Right. Um, to say it, to put it, in sort of a, the flip way, the opposite way would be the extent to which we're in distress as a physician, uh, our well-being isn't good, um, the care that we deliver is inferior. Right. And so that recognition is there. And meanwhile, we have a lot of, um, a lot of difficult uh, uh, streams of issues that are all occurring at the same time. The movement that we've made in the last 10 years to the electronic health record has been incredibly stressful. Um, for most of us, uh, probably for the young people coming out of school, it's not as bad because you know they're almost born with, with their it. with an, uh, attached to them. Um, but that's been a very difficult transition and continues to be a difficult transition. Government regulations, mandates, population health, in other words, really focusing on how do we improve health of a population? How do we address the social determinants of health, which are really underlie disease and illness uh, at a time when we have very little um, capacity to change those social determinants and we're kind of working downstream just putting out fires of the illness. The illness is really, in some ways, the end result of a whole system that has uh, um, made it 
difficult for people to really take really good care of themselves right. and take good care of their health. We as uh, physicians are equally vulnerable as our, as our patients are. Um, and one could ask, well, you know, the physicians have a, uh, a certain role in society. They're well paid. The jobs are there. We're not, we're not uh, unemployed. Um, why should the public really be concerned about our well-being? Um, and it turns out, because what I had mentioned <laughs> earlier, the quality of care that we're able to deliver uh, is connected to our well-being. So that uh, is really a, a, was a clear. So I, I had knew that firsthand through just my own experience of feeling those nascent se uh, seeds of burnout myself and then trying to do something about it. And when I found that uh, it had really helped me, right. I decided uh, to share it with my colleagues yeah. in a way. And so little by little, and we can get into that, how that happened. Uh, and my colleagues, for the most part, have really taken to it quite right. beautifully. And we have uh, demand for people taking these mindfulness-based programs, we call them, because there's a variety mm. of them um, that is, um, exceeds our capacity to deliver uh, educational and training opportunities to them to help them. Right, yeah. right. I, I, I'm curious, those three criteria you mentioned at, at first that constitute burnout, mm -hmm. to, to use the term burnout, would a physician need to um, show all three? Uh, well, not exactly. The, the burnout construct, the most common burnout construct that's being used is called the Maslach Burnout in Inventory. Okay. Christina Maslach is a social psychologist at UC Berkeley, and she designed this really for work in the um, sort of helping professions in public service professions, so not just medical professions, but other areas of uh, employment that uh, work with human services. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a better word, human services. And uh, through her definitions, uh, issues arise when any one of those three domains, emotional exhaustion, okay. depersonalization, or uh, low sense of personal accomplishment are abnormal. Right, yeah. right. All right, so, so I'm curious because I am still under the impression that there is a bias in our society about doctors that, like, you're, you're held in high esteem, you make a good living, you guys got it made, and yet I'm hearing, you said 50-plus percent of your colleagues are, are struggling with some level of this burnout. 50, yeah, 50% 50 on average across specialties of burnout. Burnout begins early in medical education. It doesn't just happen after you're working okay. for a while. You, see, you, can, you can measure it in medical school. Interestingly enough, if you take uh, a first-year medical student and measure along domains of health and well-being, psychological and physical health, compared to their age-matched controls of equal educational status, they are in better shape. They are more prepared than their age match controls to handle the rigors of medical education. If you measure these, do these same measurements at the end of the four years of medical school, they are in worse shape than their, than their um, colleagues who are not in medical school. Really? So something is happening in that medical education experience which is detrimental to one's health. Um, I, I should also mention... Uh, Medical uh, health and Ill health and wellness among physicians is of a concern. Su uh, suicide, for example, is about a two to one um, increase in uh, suicide among physicians than non physicians. Wow! So we're at high risk for all sorts of uh, conditions, medical and otherwise. Right. Um, partly due to the stresses that we're under, uh, possibly due to um, to other factors that yeah. have led us into the uh, profession. You know, other personality and uh, predispositions, right. perhaps hard to say, right. um, but it, but this is of concern. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as as you said a few moments ago, where where maybe this was a theory in the past, there's there's no question about this. There's anymore. no question about the connection. And there's one third piece I didn't mention, which I, I like to um, talk about, which is what's called the quality of caring. So there's the quality of care you can measure by outcomes, by errors by a whole host of uh, measurements. Then there's the experience of healthcare that we we have when we go to uh, and, and have a health encounter, whether it's in a hospital or in a medical right, office. Right. And that quality of caring, there's a connection between 
the extent makes sense, the extent yeah. to which we're well or not well, and that patient experience. It turns out uh, that our reimbursement methodologies are changing rapidly. Uh, we're looking more at outcomes in terms of how population health is being managed to decide on how to pay health professionals rather than just paying wi- for widgets. You know, you right. visit and you just right. pay, right. You get paid right. for it. Um, because that's uh, we would like to align the incentives correctly so that the incentive is to do a better job, to do a higher quality job. Part of the current reimbursement methods also include measures of uh, the patient experience. Right. Is it is it a positive experience? Are they feeling that the quality of caring is positive? And I think it's it's very important for any of us, and all of us have had uh, experiences, whether ourselves or with loved ones who have encountered medical uh, situations. Some of them have been um, truly positive in the sense, even if the outcome wasn't so good, right. but some of them have been horrendous. And I hear regularly of horrific experiences patients and families have right. um, in the medical encounter that um, make me cringe. And I, and I think part of it, not all of it, a lot of it is systemic and structural, but part of it has to do with the extent to which uh, burnout exists. Right. So I'm I'm sitting here and I'm I'm rereading the last sentence in your bio, and I'm and I'm thinking, all right. So you envision, um, first of all, compassion and medicine for self and others. Envision a personalized health professional patient relationship where healing is truly bidirectional. Uh, goals are mutually derived, and uh, the uniqueness of the clinical encounter reflects the central act of mutual um, physician patient high regard. I'm thinking if I'm a physician and I'm walking into my office and I am experiencing those three experiences, you talked about my ability to listen, my ability to be present, my ability to create trust and safety in the room Mm -hmm. is probably pretty impaired. Yes, absolutely. You know, I think our most useful tool that we have in medicine and the medical encounters, the same that you have in psychological behavioral encounter is our presence, yes. is our ability to listen. And we, because of our training and our expertise, through our listening, through our ability to be present, um, we can be of service yeah. and of help. Actually, just being listened to is of tremendous help. And in fact, the feedback and comments we have among the physicians who take our programs in which there is a lot of uh, communication and uh, structured sharing of narratives from right. their medical work is that, my gosh, I've never been listened to like that, or I've never listened, truly, deeply listened in that way, and the experience is very profound. And then they have that experience themselves, yeah. and then they can take that into their into the office, into yes. their encounters. Yeah, yeah. So when you first started bringing this to your colleagues, I'm, I'm curious, was there, was there a universal, oh, Mick, thanks, I haven't thought about this, was there... This is a little bit too touchy feely for me. Somewhere in the middle. What what was that experience like when you started the conversation? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm assuming you know many of my colleagues thought I was nuts or <laughs> just kind of way out there. Uh, but all I can really talk about is those who would show up for the classes. So those who came uh, had some affinity and comfort with it. Right. So those who came who realized when. Uh, when I would advertise or share with people that I do this program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, originally now we have this specific program called Mindful Practice, um, for some reason they came because either they felt that they could do this contemplative practice type of thing or they were drawn by um, their own sense of distress. And I say that because um, when we were funded by this Physicians Foundation and ran this program, it was a year-long training program of 70 physicians, uh, primary care physicians in the Rochester area, who for a year uh, spent a total of about 50-plus hours with us in training in mindful practice. When we looked at their baseline burnout scores, they were they were in distress. They mm. were in trouble. They had an average of about 17 years in medical practice at the time. Uh, they were about equally female and male, um, and uh, they were in a moderate degree of distress. So I think partly what brought them there was their own distress. They would maybe go anywhere right. with anyone who would offer something that could potentially work. Luckily, we were able to demonstrate actually some pretty strong uh, improvements in many of the domains 
of well-being and burnout that we were measuring. Um, and that's why we were published in JAMA, which is, you know, the highest impact medical journal out right. there. So once that happened, then word got out. And, and since then, we have really, people have been much more open. Now that was, uh, we, we did that study about 15 years ago now, 16, 14, 15 years ago, and published about uh, 11 years ago. Um, since then, I think there's a more of an appreciation not only uh, that these methods are not so wacky or yeah. strange, they're pretty right. normal. It's really just about uh, cultivating awareness, right. being present, and about learning how to communicate uh, together in a very clear communication, both sides of communication, speaking clearly, speaking one's truth, and listening deeply. Right, uh, right. So I love that term because I talk about that all the time in my world of, of coaching, of listening deeply. How do you define that concept in your work with physicians? Well, it's we give fairly specific instructions, and I think through the instructions, Keith, you could get a sense of the definition. But the instructions have to do with noticing the tendency as you're listening to interpret or want to give advice. Not that there's anything wrong with that tendency, right. not that there's anything wrong with wanting to do that, and it actually comes from a good place, but rather than acting on that, just set that aside, put that on the shelf for a little while and remain present, allowing your curiosity to drive the conversation so that one can, if you have a question, it should really be an authentic question that right. you really don't understand or that you want someone to elaborate more on or you just want to hear a little bit more about that rather than... Um, saying, oh, that same thing happened to me, and isn't it amazing yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah. I had the same experience, or trying to uh, give advice, or um, what happens, and we're trained for this, is when when, um, when affect arises when you're sharing with a colleague and the colleague is getting visibly uh, upset, either a little anger or tearful or whatever, rather than you know trying to fix them, mm. These colleagues have been doing just fine for many years, and they'll continue to do fine. They don't need to be fixed. fixed. They need to be allowed to be themselves yeah. and to have their feelings. And so it's really, uh, rather than just trying to fix that and uh, make it okay, noticing maybe you're uncomfortable with that emotion. That's nothing wrong with being uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable with some emotions that show right. up in the room. Nevertheless, I have to deal with them. I have to be present with them. I have to try to understand them. Um, and I think that's – so those are the types of instructions that they get and, right. the, and the practice they get in our training uh, so that uh, that's sort of the approach. Lis uh, listening deeply has to yeah. do with being curious, uh, being open, right. uh, noticing judgment when it arises. Uh, not that we – you know, we can't not be judgmental, but noticing it when it arises and not necessarily acting on it, making choices. Right. There's a – there's a uh, I'll paraphrase it, but there is a quote – it's attributed to Viktor Frankl. I don't know if he actually said it, but it's something to do with um, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And within that space lies our ability to choose our response. Right. And within that choice, ultimately lies our liberation, our freedom. Yeah. yeah. So that we're not necessarily victim to every thought that we have, every judgment right. that comes up, right. every impulse that we have. And what mindfulness and mindful practice allows us to do is actually cultivate that, that pause, that space, mm. through just becoming aware. It's not judging oneself for having a, a negative thought or being angry or, or having an emotion or wanting to give advice or wanting knowing exactly what you think the person needs. Nothing wrong with that. We're trained for that. But actually taking that pause, it can be a literal pause or a figurative pause, so that the right action then arises right. so that you can make the um, – use your discernment to actually yes. uh, let the discernment uh, guide how you're going to behave in the world. And that has ramifications beyond just the clinical encounter, but it has ramifications for all the relationships right. in your life. It, oh, no question. No question. I, I, I'm, I'm – in the world of uh, motivational interviewing – uh, they have a ratio that they talk about when you first – so in, in my world, you know, as a, as a coach or a clinician, when you f meet someone for the first time and you want to deeply listen and you want to, they – you know, it's a similar conversation about not giving in to that tendency to immediately jump in, problem solve, and fix. Mm -hmm. And they talk about a ratio of either three or five to one 
of reflections to questions. Mm. That if you are in a reflection mode, so Mick, what I hear you saying is, there is a greater chance you're not in problem-solving mode. And the minute you ask a question, even the most well-worded, open-ended question, mm -hmm. you are, there is a greater risk you're starting to problem-solve. Mm. Um, and that I think, as you're saying, people need to be heard and feel that connection first, and then we'll get to figuring out I like what that. the steps yes, are. Yes, and we do use a lot of reflection, and you're right. Reflection is, gives the person a chance to uh, hear that you're getting it. Yes, uh, and you're not filtering it too much, or if you're filtering it, they can yeah. Caden straighten you out a little bit if you're off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And that's really, really useful. Yeah. yeah. The other thing you said that, that came to my mind is asking questions for which you have no answers. Mm -hmm. right? So instead of asking questions to, to, to prove the formulation you're already moving towards, yes. I'm really going to ask questions that I have no answers. That's my true curiosity. Right. right? Yeah. Right, right. So sometimes, and that the those asking of questions of which you already have an answer, uh, is a self-sustaining bias. Right. It's it's a um, um, what do they call it? Uh, not the uh, it's it's a particular kind of bias, a confirmation bias. Yeah. So that you kind of know the answer, and you're going to get that answer. It just confirms your hypothesis <laughs> rather than having an open hypothesis and right. really exploring it. Right. You know. In today's world, if I'm a physician and I'm out there and I have some recognition that I'm struggling, within the larger profession, is there, is there safety in putting my hand up and saying, I'm struggling and I need some help? There's a growing amount of safety. It's not always completely safe. You know, I would say the problem of burnout in, in the health professions is not an individual problem. It's not my problem because I just don't have the right stuff. Right, right. Uh, it's, really a, it's really considered a structural problem, yeah. a systemic problem. And the systems, whether it's a medical center, an institution, a hospital, a health maintenance organization, right. or med school, company, you said, or a school, or, right. or you know, the, a medical school, they're coming to the recognition more and more that that is true, and they have to really look at what are the structural uh, biases and what are the what are the systemic factors that are actually creating this environment right. uh, that leads to burnout. And so um, things like being able to have peer consultation or even behavioral health services that are not um, discoverable uh, in, mm -hmm. a, in a legal situation, that are completely private, that are not um, – that will not affect your ability to maintain your staff privileges. And even if you need some pharmacological help to help you sure. with some – uh, anxiety, depression, depressive issues that this doesn't affect your licensure, which it does in many states. So things are changing. It's We're not all the way there. Right. But most um, medical institutions, if you're on staff at a medical institution, most of them will have some sort of peer um, consultation uh, ability that if you're having trouble, you can turn to someone uh, that is trained to help right. you and begin that conversation without any um, completely anonymous, without any ramifications, without any reporting back to your supervisors or your yeah, departments yeah, and that sort yeah. of thing. So that's the kind of thing that is happening more and more. Is there, is, is this, and, and I'm going to show the Beal and end all of my knowledge about this, but it, you know, you know that I've, I've spent a lot of my career in the world of, of uh, substance use disorder, and I know there's an impaired physician's program for physicians who are struggling with some type of addiction that gets them their services, keeps them safe, helps them keep their, their position. Is this within that same realm that if I came forward with more, with some concerns more in the mental health side of things um, and, and the burnout side of things that I can get that help and, and. Well, this is within that, but beyond that, this is now kind of a much more wider, widely and wider available um, opportunities for people to take care of themselves, and and I think um, and I think it's happening. People are are availing themselves of these kinds of resources in a way that, uh, you know, with substance abuse, I think it it takes quite a a recognition for by the individual that either that or they're forced into it right. through um, problems, serious problems, whether it's legal, medical, or or other or, yeah. or behavioral or otherwise that they 
that lead in the impaired physician into uh, sometimes in that case the local or state medical boards are involved right. in enforcing the issue. This is really uh, beyond that in the sense of it's really much more widely, easily available, easily accessible, Good. and it's in medical schools, residency programs, which is postgraduate after medical school right. training, and then uh, for people who are out in practice as well. So how do you approach this conversation with your patients? So you are a, a, you know, a general practitioner. I come to see you for a variety of different things, or maybe I'm that patient who sees you once every couple of years, um, and I have never entertained anything <laughs> related to mindfulness practice. Yeah. Uh, fill us in a little bit on how that conversation comes about. Well, yeah, I would say I don't really uh, initiate a lot of that in the medical encounter uh, unless several factors are present. Uh, one is uh, now, because I've been doing this long enough, people know no. know about me, so they may begin to ask me. that. That's an opening to have a conversation. I, um, When I'm working with people that are dealing with chronic medical conditions, and I can see that they're having on top of that behavioral issues, they're feeling really bad about themselves. Either they're uh, falling into depressive disorder, becoming highly anxious, and it's making it difficult for them to manage themselves. I might ask a, and just inquire, would you ever consider... Um, like you'd consider exercise to take care of yourself, to help your physical well-being, would you consider talking to a counselor? Or would you consider some practices that I could give you recordings that you may right. want to just do on your own that could just allow you to sort of be with the anxiety, be with the difficult moods in, in kind of a different way uh, rather than sort of letting it take you down, just learning a way to be with it. Right. Uh, and I could say more about this being with, which is really a large part of uh, mindfulness work. So, um, I, but I would say I don't bring it up a whole lot okay. with my patients. Um, when I first started teaching mindfulness-based stress reduction, I did recruit some of my own patients to take my first courses 20-some-odd uh, years ago. Um, and then, you know, word got out and and uh, and people realized that I was doing this and colleagues would refer patients to me right. and then colleagues would show up and say, I'd like to take this course. And that's how this whole work around working with my colleagues started. So right. it was really colleagues that came to me say and said, we'd really love to do this with other colleagues just to, to learn about these uh, in, in a program that's, that's a continuing education program with colleagues. And that's kind of how that started um, boy, that was some time ago, maybe around 2004, 2003, 2004. So um, it turns out uh, part of my work is teaching this program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction for Regular Folks. The University of Rochester has um, a program through their uh, offered through uh, an employee benefit that employees are dependents of the university can take a course in mindfulness-based stress yeah, reduction awesome. as a free benefit yeah. uh, to enhance their health, and I've been teaching that for th for the university. So I have mixtures of folks, whether they're um, staff at the medical center or their university staff or their maintenance staff or their uh, security staff, all different walks of life that come in in a mixed class and take this course. That's and I do that a few times a year. That's separate from my work with the right. physicians. Right. So let me ask you about this concept of being, because, boy, so much of, of uh, I, I think, in our society of how we measure ourselves and measure others are, is, is based on what we do, what we achieve, what we accomplish. So walk us through a little bit of, of what that shift would be to a perspective of being versus doing. Boy, that's a, that's a, big, uh, it's a big topic, but, you know, we call ourselves human beings. Right. And we, um, we call ourselves actually Homo sapiens. Actually, we call ourselves Homo, genus Homo. Our species is sapiens, but we give ourselves, I don't know if you know this, Keith, two names, two species names, Homo sapiens sapiens. Really? That's what we call ourselves. Yeah, we have two species named somewhat arrogantly, and you'll understand, <laughs> you'll understand why. So the species uh, were probably the only species in this genus, unless maybe Bigfoot's out there or right, something. Right, right, yeah. So the genus Homo. Sapiens comes from a root word that means uh, to know through the senses. I think one of the original roots is to touch or feel or taste. So we're the species that knows through the senses. Senses. 
And why did we give ourselves the second name, sapiens, homo sapiens sapiens? We know through the senses, and we know that we know. How do we know that we know? Yeah. Through our senses. Okay. So everything we experience is through our senses and uh, through our touch, taste, sight, smell. Actually, there's more senses than just those basic ones. There's an internal sense of our body. There's a sense of how we position ourselves. And like, I don't have to look at my arm, but I know I'm holding it up behind right. my head. Right. There's this proprioceptive sense. There's what's called interoception. If I was to ask you, Keith, how are you, you know, as a... As a courtesy, you may say, I'm doing fine. But if you're really to inquire yourself, you know, you can know how you are by really checking in internally. That internal checking in and feeling and sensing is another sense, right. a way of sense. Um, so we're the species that knows that we know. And how do we know that we know? Through our senses. Um, and so the being part is actually coming to our senses, actually bringing awareness to the senses, the three domains of senses that we uh that we know through is uh, touch, sensation, that kind of awareness. We have a sense of what it's like to have an emotion, to feel uh, good about something, to have a pleasant feeling, or have an unpleasant feeling, or to feel neutral. Uh, it really drives a lot of our behaviors. Right. Uh, naturally, it makes sense. Evolutionarily, we want to move towards safety, food. We want to move away from danger. Right? right, and that's so. It's this sense of I like this, I don't like that. Um, and if you walk around, um, you know, let's say the supermarket, you may and just notice what's going on in your head. You know, as you're walking down the aisle, I like this, I don't like that, I like this, and it drives. I don't kind of like the way that person is walking there. I'm going to avoid them. I'm going going to go down another aisle. We're not even aware we're right, making these right. choices. So that leads us to the third sort of. Uh, sense door, if you will, which is our cognition, what's going on in our head. So if you were to just kind of hang out and and just chill, as my kids would say, right, uh, and do nothing and just pay attention to what's actually going on in your head, you would very quickly realize that you're very, very, very busy actually up there. Mine is. And, and it turns out everyone is, believe me. And it turns out that um, that what's going on up there just below the surface of your awareness, but you can become aware. You can say, what's actually going on in my head? Actually drives our behavior from moment to moment, but most of the time we're not aware of it. it. So we act on automatic pilot. We don't know where that behavior came from. It became from some thought stream that was having that was also informed by a sensation that was informed by a feeling, you know, do I like this? I don't do yeah. I not like this. Um, so that's people refer to that as the default mode network like on a computer that's kind of what's running all the time uh in, in the your, background in the background yeah. and it's driving your behavior and it turns out the neuroscientists are very interested they they've they have mapped these networks they're medial networks that run that are very active and they do have a lot to do with um safety and and danger safety danger this right. is safe this is danger this is going on and as one opens up into this domain of being simply by bringing attention to what's going on. You don't have to change it. That's the wonderful thing about the practice of mindfulness. It's not trying to get anywhere else. It's actually just trying to be aware of how you actually are yeah. in this moment. Yeah. So you're not trying to, you know, suddenly elevate off the chair and feel really <laughs> awesome and be in nirvana. Uh -huh. You're actually, if you're in pain, you're actually aware of the pain. If you're, have a strong emotion, you're just aware of that emotion. If you're ha having a certain thought stream, you're aware of those thought streams. As one cultivates this domain of being, and without having to necessarily act on it, um, that default mode actually changes. The neuroscientists have shown that people that practice mindfulness, that it turns out it, it changes into what they, they call an experiential network. Right. It's a network that's much more open to, to new things, to learning. It actually opens up the door for learning, for actually seeing the possibilities, um, and allows us to be curious, allows us to cultivate what's called a beginner's mind, which is a way of entering, being in a very um, common situation as if for the first time. Mm. Because it turns out, uh, for you and me, Keith, the truth is, is that we have waited all of our lives to sit here in this moment and have this conversation. And you could say, are you nuts? What do you mean? We've waited all my... Well, 
everything that's ever happened to me and happened to you and everything we've worked for and everything we've we've uh, sacrificed for has brought us to here you know 640 Krieg yeah, on yeah, uh, yeah. on what is it uh July 29th yeah, 2020 yeah. Uh, and here we are yeah. here we're here we're on the leading edge we're on the frontier of our exper- of our lives this is it we don't really know what will happen next so how aware and awake we are in this moment will determine what will happen in some ways, how we will approach the next moment. If we're going to go on automatic pilot and not be aware, you know, we're sort of leaving it up to habits and leaving it up to everyone else around us to decide how, yeah. what, what track our life is going to take. Yeah. So this domain of being actually is very profound in the sense that it allows us to um, experience the only real moments we have to experience in our life, which is always now. occurring now. And and the now can include reflections on the past, can include concerns we have for the future, can include planning. I'm not against planning. I do it all the time. <laughs> I'm not against reflecting on the past. I don't really care to ruminate on things I right, cannot change. Right. Big and I don't care to become super anxious about things that haven't happened yet, although when I see myself getting that way, at least I have, uh, at least I have the possibility through my awareness of like cutting that off and saying, "Look, it hasn't happened yet. Right. Could happen. What do I need to do to prepare myself that it were to happen? Okay, I'll t- make those preparations. But why? How am I right now? How am I really right now? Yeah, I'm okay right now, actually. Yeah, I'm okay. Even um, so, this is very profound in um, with people with chronic pain, for example. It's an easy one to talk about because with chronic pain. Uh, one is often uh, worried about, well, what if the pain doesn't go away? What will mm. happen tomorrow, a year from now, five years from now, if this doesn't go away? But in this moment, the pain I'm having right now, I actually can work with. I can be with it. It's not killing me in this moment. Right. In that way, we can really put our efforts into the only time we can actually do anything, which is now, yeah. make a choice. Maybe I need to uh, take a Tylenol. That may be the most wise thing to do. Maybe I need to get in the shower and and heat up that point. Maybe I need to do a little physical therapy. Whatever it is, um, we can make the right decisions now, or we can just be caught in this worry over the future and this regret over the past. Yeah. I'm sitting here listening to you, and and the word that is coming into my head that that always resonates with me around uh, around how to do a really good helping conversation is patience. Mm. That this is a way of, of being that invites a level of patience into our lives versus that frenetic go, 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 and, and, and I have to figure things out now and I have to achieve, or as a helping person, I have to solve the problem right now mm-hmm. versus just being patient in the moment in a state of curiosity. Yeah. Very much so. Um, you know, there's a number of qualities that are are cultivated when working with mindfulness and patience. As you mentioned you named a big one. Things, in some ways, have their own time frame. They, right. they come when they come. We can manipulate to some extent to try to make things happen sooner and push things off for later, and there's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately a lot of things we don't have a lot of control over and we do have to be patient. Uh, another quality, two other qualities I'll mention, uh, which may be counterintuitive. One is called non-striving. Although, yes, we want to make plans. Um, in this moment, um, the idea is not to strive for it to be any different than it is because this is actually how it is. Because the more that we want it to be different and strive in that way and it's not meeting our expectations that's a recipe for real frustration and disappointment right. and discouragement. Right. And then it, right. and then the final, the third one I wanted to mention, there are other qualities, is acceptance. And this one's mm. a really challenging one. It's sort of related to patience. Acceptance can often be misinterpreted as resignation. Right. And acceptance is actually being, how honest can I be about how things are right now? I know that they may not be the way I want them to be, um, but... I can't really make any decisions to change things going forward if I'm not really honest with how things are now. I don't even know what to work on to change. So acceptance is an acknowledgement of this is how things are in this moment. In this moment, I'm not feeling so good Um, rather than, oh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, people are checking in with you and you're, you're obviously not fine. 
you know, just start starting with the self, being as honest as you can with the self, accepting how things are, and then deciding what do I need to do to, to move forward in my life. Right, you know? right. I'm also sitting here thinking about, so, so uh, you know, I always say to people that, that I was raised, quotes around the word raised professionally, in, in some pretty traditional ways of thinking as, as a clinician, w which is, while nobody ever said this to me directly, I, I always feel like it was inherent in the conversation, which is I'm responsible to fix. Like I have a certain responsibility there. Uh, and everything you're talking about uh, – just jives with with where I've gotten to in in my thinking in the danger of that mindset mm. because as soon as it becomes about another human being I am fully in the land of what I'm not in control of mm -hmm. fully in the land of mm -hmm. what I'm not in control of so so this th th this piece about being more in the now is just it seems to me to be another very powerful mechanism that can remind us those of us that do help others where I end Mm -hmm. And this person that I am empowered to help or have been asked to help, where they begin mm -hmm. and, and how to stay firmly planted in, in that part of the world, I do have some control over, which is now. Yes. And then there's that space between. And that's, the, yes. that's where the work is being done right. in that space. Yeah. Right. Yeah, very much so. Um, I, I've been very influenced by a psychological theory on motivation that I think has influenced the way I teach mindfulness, even though it's not embedded uh, directly in mindfulness, which is self-determination theory. Yeah. And what I like about it is this, that not only uh, is it highly motivating to be in a, a situation where you have autonomy. It's a very American thing to do, isn't yeah. it? To have autonomy. <laughs> um, and also uh, to be good at what you're doing. And right. I think uh, in the professions, we take pride in what we do. Yes. And to have that recognized is really powerful. And I think that's one of the powerful things about this COVID-19 uh, pandemic for health professionals is that the public in, in ways that are just beyond belief are, you know, saying very explicitly, you know, uh, the efficacy, the effectiveness that we're having as health professionals. We're hearing it. We're hearing gratitude, which is just mm, wonderful. Not yeah. that we need it. There's a lot of gratitude by yeah, just but doing nice. the work. It's very nice. But the third part of the um, self-determination theory, which I think is very motivating, is relate what they call relatedness or being in relationship in that, um, you know, it's one thing to cultivate mindfulness and sit in a cave somewhere and meditate and become one with being. And then it's another thing when you know when you come back home. There's a there's a uh, statement from one of the meditation teachers is after the ecstasy, the laundry. Right. You know, <laughs> it's like common life. This is real life. You know, you can go have your vacation, and isn't yeah. it true? You come home from vacation, and things haven't changed very much. You feel like oh, I'm so energized, and then within minutes of being back at the workplace, you're as reactive uh, as you were yeah, beforehand. Yeah. So this relatedness, this relationship that we do things in relationship, is really motivating to to work with others. And I think um, many of our systems uh, could improve if we recognize the importance of having relationship and having safe uh, relatedness. So safety, psychological safety, especially in the workplace, for example, is actually key, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I knew, I'm looking at the clock here, and as I said when we started, we could be here for about three hours. So just to, to, to start bringing this to a close, if um, – you know, if any of your colleagues were listening to this and and are are uh, feeling that uh, that they're struggling, what would uh, what would your words of wisdom be uh, as to as to maybe some next steps? Well, the first word of wisdom is you're struggling, and it's it's not your fault. Yeah, it's not your fault. Um, this is the nature of our work. Let's recognize it's difficult, challenging work, and um, you're not completely responsible to fix it, as you had said. Right. Um, there is a community out there. Uh, your colleagues uh, care about you. Your families care about you, of course. And there are opportunities to engage in uh, ways of being and cultivating ways of being that could help you um, with that struggle that you're having. Yeah. Uh, so reach out, uh, contact us. We're, it's, we're not the only... Uh, way of approaching this. There's many ways. Some people get it through exercise. Some people get it through sports. Some th people get it through going to the coffee shop with right, friends. Right. Uh, there are a lot of healthy ways. There's a lot of unhealthy ways 
to uh, to cope, and that's what we are hoping, uh, trying to work against the unhealthy right, ways right. of coping the, those strategies. But we're around. We're uh, found. Uh, we're, we have uh, mindful practice programs at the University of Rochester, and probably if you just Google mindful practice programs, you'll find us. Yeah, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. I'm thinking that 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 part of the message, Mick, about this is not your fault, is so important for for a population of professionals that have a long history of working hard, figuring things out, getting through rough times, uh, and, and through most of that have been very successful, calling upon their own faculties to do that, and now feel that they're at a place where that's just not working for me anymore. Yes. To hear that message about this isn't you, there's huge systemic pieces to this, that, that I, I, w- I hope that they would, they would hear that. And, and reach out. Yes, I, I think it is really important. It's one of the first things I'll say in some of the programs uh, when I travel and meet with large groups, I'll, I'll say, you know, the problem is not that you lack resilience. You right. are resilient. In fact, you're super resilient. Yeah. Uh, the, the problem is beyond you. Right. you, us, all of us. We have to work together to find strategies to, to improve. Beautiful. Dr. Mick Krasner, thank you so much for sitting in with us today. Thank you, Keith. And it's been best a pleasure. Of, best of luck with your work. It's thank so you. important. Thank you. And I thank you for uh, joining us on this episode of The Helping Conversation. It really strikes me in this conversation with Dr. Krasner that if we, the public, are going to have an expectation that when we walk into the office of our physician, that they will be there in a thoughtful way and in a way where we feel listened to, then, uh, then we really need to be mindful in our own way about some of the stresses and strains that Dr. Krasner was talking about, um, of what it is like for them in a profession that has, uh, uh, has some of the difficulties uh, that have been there for a very long time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found this helpful, meaningful, and I hope that you will join us for our next episode as we continue to explore and celebrate the practice, art, and science of the helping conversation. Have a great day. We thank you for sitting in on our discussion today on just one unique version of the helping conversation. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's podcast So we sincerely invite you to follow, rate, and most importantly, review our episodes. Please join us for our next episode as we continue the exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of the helping conversation.